Hello, everyone. We have 31 attendees. Hello. Hopefully you're beginning to be able to hear me. Thank you for joining us today. Now, some first things first that I'd like you to do is tell is open up the chat and tell us where you're coming from. So um, introduce yourself, say hi, I'm blah, 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 blah from wherever you're from. I will have a go at doing that now so that you you can you can see me, but open up the chat and type in who you are. So I am, I'm Joe from Gorilla. I love uh, evidence-based decisions. And Felix Trudel from University of Toronto. Hello, Felix. Hello, Pete. Hello, Karen. Hello, Yan, uh, Jen. Hello, Jerry, Nick and Gita and Maeve and Dan. I think we're up to about 91 people now. Jonas. Okay, now, next thing I want you to start answering in the chat is what made you embrace online research? You're all here to hear about online research. Hey, Sam, nice to see you. Um, so what made you embrace online research? Uh, what brought you here? COVID, lots of COVID responses. Yes, COVID, I, we hear from people the whole time. COVID was the push I needed to take my research online. I embraced it because of easier access to participants, but also COVID, yes. Uh, it is so great to be able to collect data so much more quickly than having to test people face-to-face -face in the lab. Um, high quality data is obviously the future for behavioral research no more underpowered samples. Hopefully that can start to be a thing of the past. Um, now, the next question I want you guys to answer in the chat, we've got 108 people here now, so that's fantastic, is what do you see as the benefits of online research? Obviously COVID was the push, but what are you hoping to get from it? We've heard a little bit about more access to participants, but diverse samples, quicker, less costly, more varied samples, scalability, lovely answers these. Can, you can be, be a bit more lingual, wider participation time. And what's this going to do for your research? Is it going to make your research better, faster, easier cross-cultural studies, less costly? Thank you so much. Um, finished data collection in two weeks. Wow, Noof, that must have felt amazing. Now, so this is great. You're answering what are the benefits of online research. Now, final question, what challenges to research do you face that you're hoping to learn about today? So this is a great question, a uh, general question that you can put into the chat and our panelists will be reading them and that will help them give you the best possible answers. Um, what you can also do if you've got specific questions, this is the time to open the Q&A panel, which you should have access to at the bottom. So if you've got a question, make it detailed so that the, so that like not an essay, obviously, but like a detailed specific question. So yeah. Fruk has done a brilliant one. How reliable is online eye tracking? Fantastic. But if you can, instead of putting that in the chat, can you put that into the Q&A panel, which is a, a, a different panel, you should also be able to access it from the bottom. Um, and then as our panelists are talking, they will start answering those questions. So I think we're up to 120 attendees. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. So hi, I'm Jo Evershed. I'm the founder CEO of Gorilla Experiment. Builder and I'm your host today. I've been helping researchers to take their studies online since 2012. So I've been doing this for a while, over nine years. For the last two years, we've also brought researchers together for our online summer conference, Be Online, so which stands for Behavioral Science Online, where pioneering researchers from all over the world share insights into online methods. Papers have their place for recording um, what was done, but unfortunately they aren't a playbook for how to run research successfully. And this is why we run a methods conference. Um, don't miss it. I think um, my colleague Ashley is going to put a link to be online into the chat now. And if you go to the be online site and pre-register for the conference, when we're, when we're, the tickets are available, it's all completely free. You'll find out about it and you'll be able to come uh, and have several hours worth of methods related conference and we might have more stuff on eye tracking then because the world might have moved in three months, who knows. Um, but we can't wait a year to share methodological best practice, life is just moving too fast. So we're now um, convening monthly Gorilla Presents to help researchers take studies online to learn from the best. Um, now we've got a poll coming up, Josh can you share the poll? The very there's, We've got this one final question for you now is how much experience do you have with Gorilla? If you can all answer that question that would be great. 
Now, as you know, today's webinar is all about eye tracking and mouse tracking uh, online. We know from listening to our us users that our mouse tracking, eye tracking and mouse tracking is very popular. Um, and we thought it would be great opportunity to bring together this vibrant community to discuss all the highs and lows of moving eye tracking and mouse tracking research out of the lab. And we've convened this panel of experts um, uh, yeah, so here, here to help us, they've been running eye tracking and mouse tracking research online for the last little while, and they're going to discuss what worked, what was challenging, and what we still need in order to do qu top quality eye tracking and mouse tracking research online. So please welcome Dr. Jens Madsen from CCNY, uh, Simone Lira Calabridge from Bangor University, Professor Tom Armstrong from Whitman College, and Jonathan Sai from UC Berkeley. And I'm now going to let each of them introduce themselves. So Jens, over to you. Yeah, I'm uh, Jens Madsen. I'm a uh, postdoc at the City College of New York and I have a pretty diverse background. I have like in computer science, um, I did my PhD in machine learning uh, and now I'm in uh, neural engineering. So we're uh, doing uh, quite a diverse uh, set of recordings all, all the way from neural responses to eye movements, heart rate, skin, you know, you name it, we record everything. And we actually started a project uh, about online education. So we were already doing eye, webcam eye tracking before uh, the pandemic happened. And then pandemic happened and we're like, oh, this is great. <laughs> you're, you're, you're coming to where we are already. So that was uh, interesting. And yeah, we've been doing quite a lot of research with uh, webcam eye, eye tracking collecting over a thousand people's um, eye movements um, when they watch educational videos. Oh, that's awesome, fantastic. So yeah. Mo, over to you, How, what are you up to? So uh, I'm Simone, I'm a PhD student at Bangor University, um, which is in North Wales. And my supervisors are Dr. Manon Jones and uh, Gary Oppenheim. And we are currently investigating how um, individuals with dyslexia acquire novel visual phonological associations or how they uh, learn associations between letters and sounds um, and how they do that uh, as compared to uh, typical readers. And we've been using uh, paired associate learning and looks at nothing paradigm in our investigation. And this is actually the first time that I've been working with eye tracking research. And because of the pandemic, I had to immediately uh, move to online uh, based eye tracking. Excellent. Now, Tom, over to you. Um, I'm an associate professor at Whitman College, and I'm an affective and clinical scientist. And so um, affective in the sense that I study the emotional modulation of attention, and then clinical in the sense that I, I study um, the emotional modulation of attention in the context of anxiety disorders and other mental illnesses. And um, I've been using eye tracking in that work for about 10 years now. And um, with a a particular focus on measuring disgust with eye tracking. And um, then through the pandemic, um, I teamed up with um, Alex Amwell Irvine and Edwin Dahlmeyer to create this mouse-based um, alternative to eye tracking that we could take online. Yeah, and uh, we're gonna have more about um, mouse view. Well, Tom's gonna to talk much more about it later and then I've got exciting news at the end of today. And Jonathan, Ty, last but not least, over to you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Jonathan Tsai, but you can call me JT, like Justin Timberlake. Um, I'm a third year grad student at UC Berkeley and I study how we learn and acquire skilled movements and hopefully we can uh, apply what we learn here at Berkeley to uh, rehabilitation and physical therapy. Mm -hmm. Excellent, fantastic. Now, one other note to um, the attendees here today, um, our panelists have put their Twitter handles in uh, next to their names. I should probably put mine in there as well. One minute. Uh, so if you want to follow any of us so that you hear what we're up to, when we're up to it and read their latest papers and get their latest advice, do do that. Now, um, let's go to the meat of it. Jens, how about we start with you giving your presentation about, about your research and I'll come back to you in about five minutes uh, and make sure you cover your hints and tips. So we want to know what you've done, what worked, what was challenging, um, what you might do differently in hindsight. What yeah, so uh, we started this online webcam eye tracking quite a few years ago. So yeah. this is, I think, I don't know how long Gorilla has had their implementation of WebGazer, but um, this is pre-COVID, pre, um, as I said. I can try to um, share my uh, screen somehow. That'd be great. 
um, this will stop other people from sharing their screen. Is that okay? Yeah, 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 do that. That's great. So I'm just gonna do here. Is it possible to, I'm just gonna go ahead and do this. So I think the reason why you contacted me because I came out with this paper um, where we use um, eye tracking to uh, improve and hopefully um, make online education better. So uh, we both use uh, professional eye tracking, which is where we are comfortable. And then we thought if we're gonna actually make this scale, we're gonna use the, the webcam. And we can read more about it. I'm just gonna give a quick spiel about uh, what we actually did in the study, okay? So we, we, we saw in, this, in the beginning of, of you know, a couple of years ago that online education was increasing rapidly. And we wanted to see sort of what are the challenges of online education compared to the classroom. Much like right now, I have no idea whether or not any of you that's listening to me is, are actually there. <laughs> I don't know if you're listening, if you're paying attention to what I'm saying. I have absolutely no clue about, I mean, because the panelists, but I just I don't know anybody else. Maybe I can see the chat if people are actually in, in, interacting. Um, and but a teacher in a classroom, they can actually see that, right? You can see whether or not the students are falling asleep or whatever, and they can, you know, in, interact with this with the with the students and change and react to, to accordingly if they're too too boring. And so we wanted to develop tools that can measure the level of attention and engagement uh, in an online setting. And so, and essentially, we need a mechanism to uh, to measure and react uh, to to the level of attention students, and hopefully make them, you know, engage in the education. And so, essentially, we did a very simple experiment. Uh, we basically measure people's eye movements while they watch uh, short educational videos, and um, then we ask them a bunch of questions about the videos. And so we wanted to see whether or not we could use eye tracking, both in the setting of like a professional eye tracker, but also the webcam to uh, predict the test scores and measure the level of attention, okay? And so I developed my own platform, sorry, Gorilla, um, but we had used, uh, we used uh, the, the, uh, the platform is called Illicit. And basically um, we use this uh, software called WebGazer. And WebGazer is basically taking the, the pixels um, of your eyes. I, I just learned that you are disabling the mouse. We had problems with that mouse movements and mouse clicks because that's how the webcam actually works. You can get an idea. This is this me making an instructional videos for my subjects because uh, I can tell you that <laughs> calibrating this is going to be uh, a nightmare for people. I had over a thousand people through this and I sat there and I talked to people about like how to calibrate this and I got a lot of mad, mad, mad responses. So <laughs> be, be aware of that. And you can also get an idea of the, the, the quality of the eye tracking. So spatially, it's, it's very, it's jeering about, and it's all about key things are light. So how much light there is on your face, uh, the quality, how close you are to the, the actual, um, the webcam. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of other things. Um, so I did two experiments, one in the classroom. So I literally had like students coming in um, after their lab session and sitting there doing this online thing. And there I can go around and like uh, teach, like show how people, how to do it. Key things is, is reflections in people's glasses. It's a nightmare. Uh, if you have light in the background, <laughs> nightmare. The problem with uh, webcams is that it throttles the, the frame rate um, so depending on the light, the, the frame rate will just drop or, 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 or go up depending on the light. Another thing that will happen is um, that uh, it, it changes the contrast. So all of a sudden, the person will completely uh, move because it's found something interesting in the background. And there you lose the eye tracking completely. And there's many of those small finicky things that can cause this to go wrong. Um, so I actually, in, in this at-home experiment that I did, you know, I, I recruited over a thousand people from Prolific and Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, I can tell you that Prolific was, was uh, a delight to work with, um, that I ended up using uh, sort of a um, um, instructional video where I literally show people how to do it because I got so many mad emails <laughs> that I had to do the uh, video about it. Uh, yeah, I'm just, I can talk about signal quality and all that later, but that was kind of like the, the practical uses of, of, and practical tips that I can give about uh, using this eye tracking software.
That's fantastic, Jens. Could you say a little bit more about what the, the content of the video was? Because that sounds like such a great idea. And it's actually something we heard from the, the guys last month talking about auditory research. It's like I had to show them a picture of where they should put their hands on the keyboards and then they got it. So this sounds the same. Like you can't just write it in text. But if you show somebody a video of like this, is that was it literally that? Like, here's a video. This is what yep. it looks like. This is what you're going to happen. And then yep. they get it, right? So I, I've, I've, I, I made a cartoon, <laughs> I, I wrote instructions. I mean, I, I, the, the first hundreds of people I went like batches of 20, like okay. nobody got it, nobody got it, nobody got it. So it's just like incremental. Okay, they didn't understand that. Why didn't I understand that? I don't know, I mean, ask my colleagues, I understand it, you know, because you're there, you're like, well, you can see what I mean. Um, and so I, I, I don't know how, how your, the calibration of gorilla works, um, but, but we That's have this, hmm? Very similar to yours. We have our yeah. in slightly different places. Right. Yeah. But it's just essentially. I mean, you can imagine you have this this uh, wireframe that's like fitting around your 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 face, right? And that wireframe has to be there because it's essentially finding your eyes, and then it takes those pixels of our from your eyes, and then use the model to predict where you're looking on the screen. Now, if this this uh, wireframe, as you saw in the image, is over here, <laughs> you can move your eyes as much as you want. This <laughs> not going to happen, you know. Um, and so it's it's important, and also you don't move around, because that's the wireframe. Uh, and often I had at this point I had a beard that was a huge problem because it didn't like uh, the shape of my face. I guess my beard was <laughs> a problem. Um, and and so I literally showed them a video of like me going through it and and talking to like showing them. Oh, this is you see now it's going wrong because the wireframe is over there. Now I go back. Oh, this is working. Now I turn off the light. You can see what happens. It's wrong, you know. And so, and also just a human, a human interaction with the subjects. Because when I get these people from prolific at Amazon account to return, I'm this is just text. Like I'm not a person. Like they don't really care. They're just like I want to make money. I want to make money. But then if you see a person like this is my research. Please do well. Like. <laughs> Come on, guys, <laughs> do it for me. Like, okay, and then they actually, you know, uh, some people thank me even for for participating. So that was really a nice experience. Oh, that's fantastic. So, uh, attendees, what I want you to type into the chat now is, in terms of top tips, what was the most valuable for you? Was it do a video instruction because then your participants will understand what they need to do? Was it do a video instruction because then they'll like you and they'll want to do your experiment for you, you or the person? Or was it make sure you don't have men with beards or ask them to shave first? So into the chat now, uh, which do you like? Video instructions to get better data, video instructions are great if people watch them, video instructions, glasses and background, get better data. So you can see, Jens, everybody is learning a lot from what you've said already. That was tremendously helpful, um, particularly video instructions for all of the reasons. Excellent. So. We're now going to go over to Simone. Simone, how, do you want to share what you've been doing? Because you've been taking similar but different approaches to eye tracking. Uh, yes, let me share my screen here now. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm assuming that you guys can see yeah. my screen. Yeah. We yeah. can see that. Okay, so first of all, we'd like to thank you guys for inviting me uh, to this webinar. So I'll talk a little bit about my personal experience as a Gorilla user, um, and also it's my first time doing an eye tracking research as well. And I'll try to give you a couple of tips, tips as well on what you could do to get uh, high quality data. And there's gonna be, I think, some overlapping with what uh, Jens uh, just mentioned uh, right now, okay? So um, as I briefly mentioned in my introduction, uh, in our lab, we're investigating the different processes underpinning acquisition of novel letter sound associations um, in our lab. And our aim with that is to uh, better understand how we bind visual and phonological information uh, together and what exactly makes this process uh, so effortful for um, some readers. Um, so in Gorilla, we used a paired associate learning uh, par uh, paradigm um, in one of the tasks. So as you can see in the demonstration, um, um, in each trial, there were three shapes on the screen. Participants would first uh, learn which sort of words would go uh, with which one of the shapes, and then they would be tested on their ability to recognize um, the pairs. Um, after presenting the bindings, we play uh, one of the three sort of words from each trial. Uh, we then present a blank screen, 
And then we show the participants uh, the three pairs again. And what we do is uh, we track participants' looks during the blank screen presentation to see if they will um, visually revisit uh, the screen locations, locations that were previously um, occupied by the target. Um, and the rationale behind this is that sometimes when we are trying to remember something, uh, we might look at the spatial location where that information, where that piece of information uh, was presented. Um, and we do that even if the spatial location is now empty, right? So this task that we administer in Gorilla uh, is an attempt to replicate uh, findings from a previous uh, similar eye tracking study done by um, my supervisors, um, Jones and colleagues. Um, and it's a similar paradigm uh, using impaired associate learning and looking at nothing um, as well um, in typical and uh, dyslexic uh, readers. So one of the things, this has a lot to do with uh, Jens, uh, as was mentioning before, uh, one of the things that I would strongly suggest that you check when you're pre-processing your eye tracking data in Gorilla is to check, uh, to check the uh, face uh, conf values. Uh, so the values in this column here, they, they range from uh, zero to one. And what it measures is how strongly uh, the image under the model actually resembles a face, right? So one means that there was a perfect fit and zero means that there was no fit, as you can see here uh, in the illustration. And according to Gorilla's recommendation, uh, values that are over 0.5 are ideal. Um, and the reason why I think it's so important uh, to check this carefully is because some of your participants might move their heads uh, during the task, as um, uh, James was mentioning before, or they might accidentally like cover their faces if they are bored or something like that. Um, they, they might put their glasses on or take their glasses off during the experiments. There might be some changes uh, in the lighting conditions as well. So a lot of things can happen uh, mid-experiment and then uh, their faces will no longer be detected. So it's important that you exclude predictions that have a very low uh, face count uh, value. That's extremely important. So one thing which we have been doing is uh, we add a questionnaire at the beginning of the experiment and then we ask participants uh, the conditions under which they will be doing the tasks. So some of the questions that I thought that were relevant to eye tracking research are uh, the ones that are highlighted here. So we ask them uh, in what kind of lighting they will be uh, doing the tasks. Is it daylight? Are they going to be using artificial lighting? Are they going to be placing their laptops on their lap or on their desks, right? We cannot unfortunately force participants to uh, uh, place their laptops on, on the desk, which would be ideal. And some of them still end up uh, placing their laptops on, on their laps, right? And we also ask them if they're gonna be wearing uh, glasses during the experiments, because we, we cannot always exclude participants who are wearing glasses, right? Um, so what I do with this, uh, based on participants' uh, responses, I try to generate some plots so that I can visually inspect what may be causing the poor uh, face count values for some of the participants, right? So as an overall, as you can see here, um, the mean value for all of the conditions was uh, above the recommended uh, threshold, right? But you can see also that the data quality was affected to some, ex uh, to some extent in some of the conditions, right? So in this uh, particular sample here, uh, the model fit was equally fine for people wearing or not wearing glasses. Uh, but in one of the other pilots that we conducted, it was really, really poor for participants wearing glasses. So you have to think that um, if it would be okay for you to exclude participants uh, wearing glasses from your um, experiment. We cannot do that. Um, the second plot suggests that natural daylight seems to be a bit better for the remote um, eye tracker. So what I've been trying to do is I release the experiment in batches and I try to schedule them to become available uh, early in the morning so that I can try to recruit more people who are actually gonna be doing the task during the day and sometimes I just pause uh, the experiment. Um, here you can see as well that placing the computer on the lap is also not ideal, but honestly, I don't know how to convince participants not to do that. I try to ask them, I, I give uh, visual instructions as well, but it doesn't always um, uh, work. The last one, you can see that uh, in my experiments, we have six blocks uh, and lots of, uh, we have 216 trials in each one of the blocks. So it's a very long experiment. And the impression that I get is that as people get tired over the course of the experiment, they start moving more or they start uh, touching their faces and, and doing things like that. So the data quality will tend to decrease um, towards the end of the experiment. So that's 
That's why it's important for you to counterbalance everything that you can and randomize everything. So this is it for now. Um, I'd like to thank my supervisors as well. And I have a couple more tips, which I might uh, show you guys later if we have time. Uh, you are muted, Joe. <laughs> thank you so much, Simone. That was absolutely fantastic. So uh, attendees, what I want you to, uh, to answer there is like, what for you was the most valuable thing that Simone said? Maybe it was face config, checking those numbers, or it might've been the settings and questions like just asking people what their setup is so that you can exclude participants if they've got a setup that you don't like? Or was it opening experiments in the morning, checking integrity of face models? Or was it actually just seeing how each of those settings reduces the quality of the data? Because I found that fascinating, seeing those plots where you can just see the quality of the data. Yes, the face clip fungus stuff is super important. How many lighting wasn't an important, whereas the laptop was placed. Yeah, so everybody's getting so much value for what, from what you said, Simone. Thank you so much for that. So know. next, we're going to go to Tom Armstrong, who's going to talk to us, I think, about mouse view. All right, let me get my screen share going here. Okay, um, so um, I'm going to be talking about a tool that I co-created with Alex Annabel Irvine and Edwin Dahlmeyer uh, that is a online alternative to eye tracking. And um, big thanks to Alex for um, developing this um, brilliant JavaScript um, to make this thing happen and for Edwin uh, for um, really guiding us in terms of how to mimic the visual system and bringing his expertise as a cognitive scientist to bear. Um, so I mentioned before, I'm an uh, affective and clinical scientist. And so um, in these areas, people often use passive viewing tasks to study um, the emotional modulation of attention, or as it's often called, attentional bias. Um, and in these tasks, uh, participants are asked to look at uh, stimuli however they please. And these stimuli are typically presented in arrays of from two to as many as 16 stimuli. Some of them are neutral, and then some of the images are um, affective or emotionally laden or charged. Um, here's some data from a task with just two images, a disgusting image paired with a neutral image, or a pleasant image paired with a neutral image. And um, I'll just give you a sense of some of the um, the components of gaze that are modulated by emotion in these studies. And so um, one, one thing we see is that at the beginning of the trial, people tend to orient towards um, any emotional or affective image. Um, uh, Margaret Bradley and Peter Lang have called this natural selective attention. Um, and in general, when people talk about attentional bias for threat or attentional bias for motivational, motivationally relevant stimuli, they're talking about this phenomenon. It's often measured with reaction time measures. Um, what's more unique about eye tracking is this um, other component um, that I can refer to as strategic gaze or voluntary gaze. And um, this plays out a little bit later in the trial when uh, participants kind of take control of the wheel with their eye movements. And um, here you see um, a big difference according to um, whether people uh, like a stim stimulus, whether they want what they see in the picture or whether they're repulsed by it. Um, and so you don't see a valence differences with that first component, but here in this more voluntary gaze, um, you see some really interesting effects. Um, and so you can measure this with total dwell time during a trial. And one of the great things about this measure is that in comparison to these reaction time measures um, of attentional bias that have been pretty thoroughly critiqued, and also uh, the, the eye tracking measure of that initial capture, this metric is very reliable. Um, also, it's valid um, in the sense that, for example, um, if you look at how much people look away from something that's gross, that's going to correlate strongly with um, how gross they say the stimulus is. And the same thing for a pet of stimulus. So how much people want to eat food that they see um, will correlate with how much they look at it. Um, so, you know, I've been doing this for about 10 years. Everything I, every study I do involves eye tracking, um, but it comes with some limitations. So first, it's expensive. Um, Edwin Dahlmeyer has done uh, a really amazing job democratizing eye tracking by uh, developing a toolbox that wraps around um, cheap commercial grade eye trackers. Um, but even with 
it being possible to now buy 10 eye trackers, for example, it's still hard to scale up the research. Um, like uh, what Joe was talking about um, earlier, how, you know, no more underpowered research, more diverse samples. Well, it's hard to do that with um, the hardware. And then as I learned about a year ago, uh, it's not pandemic proof. And so you got to bring folks into the lab. Um, you can't really do this online, although, as we just heard, there's some pretty exciting um, options. And really, for me, webcam eye tracking is a holy grail. Um, but in the meantime, um, I wanted to see if there were some other alternatives that would be you know, ready to go out of the box for um, eye tracking researchers. And uh, one tradition, uh, it turns out, is using um, mouse view, where uh, there's a mouse that controls um, a little a small aperture and allows you to sort of look through this little window and explore an image. Now, I thought this was a pretty novel idea. Turns out folks have been doing this for uh, maybe 20 years, and they came up with some pretty clever terms like fovea um, for the way this sort of mimics foveal vision. Um, also, there's been a lot of validation work showing that um, uh, mouse viewing uh, correlates a lot with regular viewing as measured by an eye tracker. So, um, what, what we were setting out to do uh, was first to see if um, mouse viewing would work in affective and clinical science to see if you get this sort of um, hot attention as well as the cold attention that you see in just sort of browsing a web page. And then in particular, we wanted to um, create a tool uh, sort of in the sphere of Gorilla that would be immediately accessible to researchers and you could use um, without you know, programming and uh, having technical skills. And so we actually used, um, we did this in Gorilla and uh, we collected some data um, on Gorilla uh, over Prolific. And we have data, this is from a, a pilot study we did, our first study with 160 participants. And let me just show you what the task looks like. I'm gonna zip ahead because I'm a discuss researcher and you don't wanna see what's um, on the first trial. At least you can see it blurred, but that's good enough. Okay, so you can see someone's moving a cursor locked aperture and there's this Gaussian filter used to blur the screen to mimic peripheral vision. And participants can explore the image with the mouse. Um, okay, move on. Uh, okay. So um, one of the great things about mouse view is that um, uh, Alex has created in a really flexible manner where users can customize um, the overlay. So you can use uh, the Gaussian blur, you can use um, a solid background, you can use different levels of opacity. You can also vary the size of the aperture. And this is something that we haven't really systematically varied yet. Um, right now it's just sort of set to mimic foveal vision to be about two degrees or so. Um, so we've done this pilot study, about 160 people. And the first thing we want to see is does, um, does the mouse scanning resemble gaze scanning? And um, Edwin did some really uh, brilliant analyses to be able to sort of answer this quantitatively and statistically. And we found that the two really converge. You can see it here in the scan paths. Like for example, if you look over the right, discussed five, really similar pattern of exploration. We blurred that so that you can't see the proprietary IAPS images. Um, now the, the, the bigger question for me, does this capture hot attention? Does this capture the emotional modulation of attention that we see with eye tracking? And so here on the left, you can see um, the eye tracking plot that I showed you before. Over here on the right uh, is the mouse view plot. And um, in terms of that second component of gaze I talked about, that strategic gaze, uh, we see that we see that coming through in the mouse view data really nicely. Even some of these subtle effects, like the fact that people look more at unpleasant images the first time before they start avoiding them. So we have that approach and that avoidance in the strategic gaze. The one thing that's missing uh, maybe not surprisingly, is this more automatic capture of gaze at the beginning of the trial because the mouse movements are more effortful, more voluntary. Um, we've now done a couple more of these studies, and we found that um, uh, this dwell time index with the mouse viewing is very reliable in terms of internal consistency. Also, we're finding that it correlates very nicely with self-report ratings of images and individual differences related to images like we see with eye gaze. Um, so it seems like a pretty promising tool. And I can tell you more about it in a minute, but I just wanted to really quickly thank um, Gorilla. I'm excited about um, any announcement that might be coming and my college for funding um, some of this uh, validation research and the members of my lab who are currently doing uh, with in-person uh, validation against eye tracking uh, in person in the lab.
Thank you so much, Tom. That was absolutely fascinating. A number of people have said in the chat, like that was, that was just absolutely fascinating, your research. I'm so impressed. Um, what I'd love to hear from attendees, like, what do you think about mouse view? Doesn't that look tremendous? I'm so excited by what that, because there are limits to what ICA tracking we can do with the webcam, right? I'm sure we can get yes. two zones, maybe six. But what I think is really exciting about mouse view is it, it, it allows you to do that much more detailed eye tracking like research. It's a different methodology that's going to make stuff that otherwise wouldn't be possible to take online possible. Um, Joanna, I had no, I'd never heard of this before, before. It sounds so exciting. It seems like such a reasonable way to investigate volitional attention in nine long contacts. I, I think people have been really inspired by, by what you said, Tom. And the exciting news for those of you listening today, uh, Mouse View is going to be a closed beta zone from next week in Gorilla. To get access to any closed beta zone, all you need to do is go to the support desk, fill out the form, I want access to a closed beta zone, this one, and it gets applied instantly to your account. That's the the case for eye tracking, it will be the case for mouse view, they'll be able to be used uh, without, um, you don't need any coding to be able to use them. If they're in closed beta, it's just an indication from us that uh, there isn't a lot of published research out there, we haven't validated it, so we say handle with care, right? Like run your pilots, check your data, check it thoroughly, make your, make additional, um, uh, so when I'm looking, uh, data quality checks than you would otherwise. With things like showing images, you can see that it's correct, right? And the, and the data that you're collecting isn't, isn't complicated. So there are, th there are zones that we don't need to put in closed beta. Until things have been published and been validated, we keep things in closed beta where they're more technically complex. Um, that's, what, that's what that means. But yes, you can have access. So Mouse View coming to Gorilla next week. And thank you to Tom and to Alex, who I think is on the call, and Edwin, they're all here today. Um, if you're impressed by Mass View, can you type Mass View into the chat here, just so that Tom and Edwin and Alex will get a like a whoop whoop from you guys, because they've put massive amount of work into getting this done. And I think they deserve the equivalent of a little round of applause for that. Thank you so much. Now, finally, over to Jonathan to talk about what you've been up to. Well, Okay, um, can, can, you see, uh, can you see my screen? Okay, perfect, perfect. So uh, my name is Jonathan, go by JT, and I study how humans control and uh, acquire skilled movement. So let me give you an example of this through this video. My talk's over. Uh, no, just kidding. Uh, so this is, uh, this happens every day, um, how we adapt and adjust our movements to changes in the environment and the body. And this process, this learning process requires multiple components. It's a lot of trial and error. Your body just kind of figures it out, but it's also a lot of instruction, how the, the father here instructs the, the son to jump on this chair. And of course, reward too at the end with the, with the hug. And uh, we study this in the lab by asking people to do something a little bit more mundane. So typically you're in this dark room, you're asked to hold this kind of uh, this digitizing pen. You don't see your arm and you're asked to reach to this blue target controlling this red cursor on the screen. And we describe this as plain fruit ninja. Try and slice through the blue dot using your uh, red cursor. And on the right side, I'm, sh I'm gonna show you some data. So initially when people reach target controlling this red cursor, they can't see their hand. Um, people are on target. On target means uh, hand angle zero and X axis is time. Um, so more reaches means if you're moving across the X axis. But then we add a perturbation. So we introduce a 15 degree offset from the target. The cursor is always gonna move 15 degrees away from the target. We tell you, we say, Joe, this cursor has nothing to do with you, ignore it just keep on reaching to the target. And so you see here on the right, this is participants data. People can't keep reaching to the target. They 
implicitly respond to this red cursor by moving in the opposite direction. They drift off uh, further and further away to 20 degrees. Um, eventually, they reach an asymptote, uh, you know, around 20 degrees. And when we turn off the feedback, when we turn off the cursor, people, you know, drift a little bit back to the target. And this whole process is implicit. If I asked you where your hand is, uh, your actual hand is 20 degrees away from the target. If I asked you where your hand is, you tell me your hand is around the target. This is where you feel your hand. You feel your hand to be at the target. Your hand is 20 degrees off the target. And this is how we study implicit motor learning in the lab. But because of the pandemic, we built a tool to, um, to test this online. And so in, in a paper uh, preprint recently released, we compared in-person data using this kind of sophisticated uh, machinery that typically costs around $10,000 to set up. And you can see on the, on the bottom, this is the data we have in the lab. We just create different offsets away from the target, but nonetheless, people drift further and further away from the target. And we have data from online using this mouth, uh, this template we created to track your mouse movements and you're reaching to different targets. The behavior in person and online seem quite similar. But in person, uh, online research affords some uh, great advantages. And I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, for in-lab results, we took around six months of in-person, just like come to the lab, collect your data. For the online results, we collected 120 people in a day. And so that's a huge uh, time saver uh, in terms of cost as well. And of course, we have a more diverse population. I just wanna give a few tips before I uh, sign off here. So a few tips are instruction checks. So for instance, in our study, we asked people to reach to the target and ignore the cursor feedback, just continue reaching. So an instruction check question we ask is, where are you going to reach? Option A, the target. Option two, away from the target. And if you choose away from the target, then we say, uh, sorry, um, that was the wrong answer. And um, please try again next time. Um, patch files. So for instance, sometimes we would say, don't reach to this target. You know, the target presents itself and we say, don't reach to the target. And if we see that participants continue to reach the target. They might be just not paying attention, just swiping their hand towards the target. So we use some catch trials to uh, filter out um, you know, good and bad subjects. We have baseline variability measures. So reach the target. And if we see you're reaching in an erratic way, then we typically say, okay, sorry, um, try again next time. Again, movement time is a great indicator, especially for uh, mouse tracking. If you, in the middle of the experiment, you go to the restroom and you come back, um, these are things that can be tracked using movement time, which is typically, you know, someone might, you know, not take your experiment seriously, but not always. And Simone brought this up, but batching and iterating, uh, getting feedback from a lay person to understand instructions was huge for us. Um, and last but not least, uh, something that Tom brought up was sometimes when you see behavior that's different between in lab and online, this is something we struggle with. Is it reflective of something that's interesting that's different between online and in-person or is it noise? So that's something uh, we're struggling with, but we came to the conclusion that it, you know, sometimes it's just different. You're using a mouse versus a robot in the lab. So that can be very different. What I'm excited about uh, this mouse tracking research and, um, and how it relates to motor learning is typically motor learning patient research is around 10 people. But uh, now, because we can just send a link to these participants, they're able to access the link and do these uh, uh, experiments at home. We can access a huge, larger group of patient populations that typically uh, may be logistically hard to invite to the lab. And second, um, teaching. I'm not going to belabor this point. Um, third is public outreach. So we put our experiment on this Test My Brain website, and people just try out the game and learn a little bit about their brain. And that's an easy way to collect data, but also for people to learn a little bit about themselves. Um, here are some open resources. You can take a screenshot, but we have we share our template, uh, how to implement these mouse tracking experiments online. It's also integrated with uh, Gorilla. Uh, we have a manual to help you set it up. We have a paper, and here's a demo. You can try it out yourself. Uh, and lastly, I want to thank my team. So Alan, who did a lot of the work, uh, 
coding up the experiment, my advisor, Rich Ivory, and Guy and Ken Nakayama, they all collectively really put this together. And we're really excited about where it's going. So thank you again for your time. Thank you so much, John, that was fantastic. Now, uh, what I want to hear from the panel, uh, from the attendees, did you like the more from John, the, um, the advantages of online research, the cost saving, the time saving, or were you more blown away by his tips for taking, for getting good quality mouse tracking data online? Tips, instruction check questions, tips, tips more tips and that girl who jumped onto that um stool at the beginning were you not just blown away by her if you were blown away by her resilience to jumping up on things type blown away into the chat i thought she was tremendous she must be about the same age as my son and and he would not do that for sure that was something quite excited so exciting uh, john i want to ask a follow-up question your mouse tracking experiment is have you shared that in gorilla open materials yeah, yep, yeah. that is in Gorilla Open Materials. Yep. If you um, want, if you if you've got the link, do you want to dump that into the chat? Because then, if every, anybody wants to do a replication or an extension, they can just they can just clone the study and um, and see how you've done it, see how you've implemented it. Um, you know, perfect. it's just super easy way of sharing research and allowing people to build on on the research that's gone before without without wasting time. Ashley, make sure we've got a link to that as well. Can you so that when we send a follow up email on Monday, we can make sure that everybody who's here today can uh, can get access to that. Oh, I think Josh has already set, saved it, shared it, John. You're off the hook. Excellent. We've now come to Q&A time. There are lots and lots of questions. Um, there are a third, total of 32 questions of which 16 have already been answered by you fine people as we go through. There are some more questions though. Um, Edwin has got a question of how do people deal with the huge attrition of participants in web-based eye tracking? Uh, Simone or Jens, can either of you speak on that one? How have you dealt with attrition? Um, yeah, it's a bit complicated because my experiment is a very long one and participants end up um, getting tired and they quit the experiment uh, Yeah, in the middle of it. There is not much that we can do about it, but just keep recruiting more participants. So um, we ran a power analysis, which uh, suggested that uh, we needed uh, 75, 70 participants for our study. So our goal was to uh, recruit 70, 70 participants, no matter what. So if someone quits midway, we just reject the participant and we just recruit uh, an additional one to, as a substitute, yeah, as a replacement. <laughs> So I think, uh, at least for, for my uh, perspective, it, it's very different uh, comparing uh, stationary, like uh, viewing or eye tracking of images, and then in my case, video. So video is just moving constantly, right? And, and so you can't just, you can show an image and, you know, my, they have to watch the whole video and I have to synchronize it in, in time. It also depends on, um, the analysis method you, you do. In my case, I don't really look at any spatial information. Spatial information for me is irrelevant. I use the correlation. So how similar people's eye movements are across time. I use other people as a reference. In that sense, it can be very noisy, the data actually. You can actually move around and it is quite robust in that sense. Um, and so in that it sort of uh, it depends on, you know, yeah, the level of noise you can do in the system. For my case, because it was video, I put in auxiliary tasks, like uh, people can watch, look at dots um, to see if I if they were actually there or not, you know, or, or things like that to control for those things, or else you're in big trouble because you have no clue what's happening. And so having those extra things uh, to make sure that, yeah, there and also uh, it, it turns out the attention span of an online user at least in, in educational content it's around like five six minutes after that they're gone you can't like it doesn't matter they, they're bored like could be bothered and so my tasks were always around there like the videos that i showed were always you know five six minutes long three minutes long and then some questions but they couldn't be asked to sit still because when you use web gazers, you have to sit still. It depends on you guys are using spatial tasks, right? So this would be a problem for you. <laughs> for me, it's fine because like I use the temple course, but for spatial people, that's gonna be an issue because the whole thing is just gonna shift. 
And how do you detect that, right? Do you have to somehow either insert some things like now you look at this dot and now I can recalibrate my data or something, or I, I don't know how you guys are dealing with that, but, but um, yeah, those are the things that you need to worry about. Yeah, I was just gonna uh, add something that uh, because we have a very long experiment with lots of trials, uh, we can lose some uh, some data and it's still going to be fine, right? So I have 216 trials uh, in my experiments. So it's not a six minute uh, long one, it's a two hour experiment. Uh, so even if I do lose some data, it's relatively it's still fine. It's still, yeah, I have enough power for that. Yeah, but you still, I mean, you still have the calibration, you, you do the calibration, right? And I'm assuming you do it once, right? And you have to sort of, or you do it multiple times? Multiple times, yeah. Right. So we have you six have to blocks. Do that. Yeah, 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 it makes sense. So, so we have we do it at the beginning of each block and also in the middle of each block as well, just to make sure yeah. that it's as accurate as possible. Yeah. Because what you saw what I just did there, right? I readjusted it myself. And this is like something natural. It's like, I just need, ah, yes. yeah, that's better, you know? That's a problem. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's why we do that uh, multiple times. <laughs> and we, we do it even without knowing it. Simone, how often do you recalibrate? Um, so we have six blocks. So at the beginning of each block and in the middle of each block. So every um, 18 trials. Yeah, we, okay, that makes sense. So um, but, yeah, so in, in previous um, uh, lectures we've had about online methods, people have said like a good length for an online experiment is around 20 minutes, much longer than that, people start to get tired. Um, if you pay people better, you get better quality participants. So that's another way that you can reduce attrition, like double your fees, see what happens. Uh, people are willing to stick away, stick around longer, longer if they um, if they're being paid well for their time. And then one of the researchers, Ralph Miller uh, from New York, he does long studies like Simone does online. Um, and what he does is about every 15 minutes, he puts in like a five minute break. And he says it's like, look, you um, please go away, get up, walk around, do something else, stretch, you know, maybe you need to go to the loo, maybe something you need to deal with, but you have to be back in five minutes. When you press next, that five minute, like, well, like I think it happens automatically. And that gives people that ability to like, oh, I really need to stretch and move so that you can, you can build in an experience that is manageable for your participants. And so the, the, if you're struggling with attrition, the thing to do is to um, pilot different ideas until you find what works for your experiments. There aren't things that will work for everyone, but there are techniques and approaches that you can try out, sort of experimentation in real time, find out what's going to work. And, uh, and that can be really helpful too. Tom, there are quite a few questions about um, I, can you guys see the, the Q and A's? If you pull up the Q and A panel, there are some nice ones about my, uh, mouse tracking here that I think Tom might be, uh, be able to answer. So one here, how viable is it to use mouse tracking in reading research? For example, asking participants to move their cursor as they read. Um, and then similarly, Jens and Simone, there are questions about like um, eye fixations uh, and data quality. You can also type answers. So I think we'll run out of time if we try and cover all of those live, but maybe Jens and Simone, you can you can have a go at answering some of the ones uh, that are more technical. But Tom, perhaps you could speak about um, mouse tracking, eye tracking, the crossover. You're muted. You're muted. Yeah. There are so, there are so many, but let me try to like do it justice. So. I mean, right now, I think, I don't know what you what unique processes we get from mouse view. I'm thinking it as being just, um, you know, a stand in for that voluntary exploration that we see with the eye tracking. Um, in terms of what that gets you beyond like a um, great question about beyond like just self report. Um, there are some interesting ways in which self report and eye tracking do diverge that we found um, that I can't do justice to right now. Um, but uh, so I think that you, you often pick up things with self report that you don't get uh with i'm sorry you get things with eye tracking that you don't get with self report like for example edwin and i found that um eye movement avoidance of disgusting simile doesn't habituate whereas people will say they're less disgusted but then they'll continue to look away from things and so sometimes um you know there's more subtle things people can't introspect on um about reading edwin took that question on um uh left versus right mouse fascinating i'm not sure and then importantly the touch screens that is in the work. So maybe um, uh, if Alex can jump on that question, that's the next thing that he's working on, making this sort of work with touch screens. Right now, it's just for um, desktop, laptop, 
um, Chrome, Edge, or Firefox. Anything that works in Gorilla probably might already work for Touch. I, I don't know, and unfortunately, Will isn't here, but I'll, I will make sure that that question gets asked next week because by default, everything in Gorilla is, is Touch compatible um, as well. Cool. Um, I'm trying to pick out a good next question. What's the next one at the top? Uh, can we learn something from online mouse tracking that we cannot learn from online eye tracking? Do you think, can anyone speak to that? Or have you already? What was, what was the uh, question, sorry? Can we learn something from online mouse tracking that we cannot learn from online eye tracking? I, I think they, they're, they're different methods that answer different questions, right? So yeah. there's certainly a correlation between uh, where you look and where the mouse is, right? Mm -hmm. So this is clear and it also depends on the task. In my case, with a video, you, you're not like moving around the mouse where you're looking because you're watching a video. That's like not a natural behavior. But if you are clicking of, of, of like just using a UI, you know, like buttons and things like that, surely that's like they're highly correlated. So it very much depends on the task. That's really good. So that we are now five minutes to six. So I'm going to wrap this up. There are lots and lots more questions, uh, but I don't think we can get through all of them um, today. But hopefully we've managed to answer, we've managed to answer 24 questions. So I don't think we've done a really, really great job there. Actually, there's one more, which I think Simone might be able to answer quickly. What's the relationship between face config and calibration accuracy measure? Did you, did you look at both of those? Um... No, I didn't actually uh, investigate that. But what I did was uh, I did similar plots for the uh, uh, calibration um, analysis as well um, in Gorilla. And they were very similar to what I demonstrated um, to you guys. So depending on whether participants were wearing glasses or not, um, there were some yeah lower uh, values for that. But uh, what I tried to do, I tried to use, uh, well, the five points calibration um, in Gorilla. And if calibration fails for at least one of the points, uh, the calibration has to be reattempted. So I'm trying to be very strict uh, in, in that sense. Um, yeah, that's my default mode now. <laughs> so if it fails for just one of the points, I think it's just best to try to, to recalibrate, which can be quite frustrating for some participants, but that will ensure that we have better um, data quality. Yeah. Yeah. That, that <laughs> Now I have one last question for the panel, which is what do you see the next year bringing to this area of research? And we're going to do it in reverse order. So starting with JT. I'm, I'm going to say that uh, at least in, in my field, I'm most excited about larger scale patient research. And that, that's number one, reaching individuals who are typically um, harder to reach. Um, and so larger scale in that sense, but another is reaching but for instance, people without proprioception. So for, for instance, you don't have a sense of body awareness. I'm pretty sure most of you have never met someone like that because in, in my view, I think there's only three people in the world um, that, that have like, are in the literature and kind of being able to work with these people kind of remotely would be a great opportunity in the future. Uh, that's brilliant. And Tom, how about for you? What does the next year hold? Um, so one, getting Masu onto mobile devices to work with touch screen. Um, and then just seeing uh, the method get adopted by people in different areas um, and to see how a lot of these eye tracking finds replicate and also to get some, um, hopefully get this in the task zones with some different, uh, different varieties of eye tracking tasks. So larger matrices, you know, 16 simile instead of two, um, just incrementally working like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's always so exciting when you create a new method is you don't know how people are going to use it and somebody's going to see that and go, whoa, I could do something that you'd never imagined. And suddenly yeah. a whole new area of research becomes possible. That's, yeah. that's hugely exciting. Simone, how about you? What does the next year hold? Uh, I was just thinking perhaps the possibility of testing uh, participants uh, who are speakers of different languages, that would be really nice as well. So with remote eye tracking, we can do that more easily. So hopefully, hopefully, that hopefully that's what's going to happen. <laughs> and Jens, yeah, finally to you. So um, we're working in, in online education and we're measuring the level of attention of students when they watch this educational material. And what we're excited about is that we can actually uh, reverse 
uh, sort of that uh, process. So we can uh, have the person uh, in the browser measure the level of attention and we can adapt the educational content to the level of attention. So if students are dropping out or not looking, we can actually intervene and make interventions um, so that uh, hopefully we can improve online education. You're muted. Sorry, Tom just dropped out. So I was just checking what happened there. Yeah, I, the online education thing, I can see it being being tremendous. And that's what everybody needs. If you had one tip for everybody watching today to improve online education, what would it be? Um, do short and uh, show your face and skip the boring uh, long PowerPoints. <laughs> Excellent. All about human interaction, isn't it? Um, it's, all, it's all about the, the interaction. If you can see a per person's face, you're there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe it's when you've got your students in your class, get them to turn their videos on, right? They'll feel like they're there it's together in a room. so important. So important. So back to the participants. There's a, there were 150 of you for most of today. Thank you so much for joining our third Gorilla Presents webinar. Each month we'll be addressing a different topic on online behavioral research. Um, so why not write in the chat with suggestions uh, of what you'd like to um, us to cover next? Yes, thank you messages to please through to our amazing panelists and Tom as well. Um, you know, it's very difficult to judge how much value you've got out from here, but like big thank yous um, uh, uh, really helps uh, these guys know that it that that you've really appreciated the wisdom that they've had for you today. Um, there will be a cert. Well, I think we emailed you with a survey straight after this to help us make these sessions more useful. Please fill it out. It's tremendously useful to us and allows us to make each session better and better. You guys can see the value that you've got out of this today by giving us feedback. We can make future sessions even better. Um, so you're doing a uh, solid for the whole research community. The next webinar is going to be about speech production experiments online. It's going to be in late April. Uh, so if speech production experiments where people talk, uh, it's going to be 29th of April. There you go. Um, where people talk and you're collecting their, their voice. If that's your bag, then make sure you sign up for that one as well. Um, thank you and good night. Massive, one final massive thank you to the panelists. Thank you so much for giving your time to the research community today. And uh, we'll all chat in a minute in the next room. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.